We've come to a moment in destiny when certain problems must be resolved or we cannot have the same society that we've had previously. The inheritance that has been given to us from our foreparents is rich and is bountiful. If we destroy it in our own time or if we permit stupidity to cause us to permit it to be destroyed, we're not worthy of the inheritance that has been handed down to us. One of the greatest problems facing this society today is unprovoked murder, and most of the time, multiple murder. When we look at the subject and we think about it, we want you to understand it clearly, and for that reason, we're giving you a number of lessons on it. This is part two, and we trust that you will have seen part one, and part three will be coming up uh, shortly after this, this lecture that we're giving you at, at this moment. And whether you agree with my deductions on this subject or not, I'm sure you realize that discussion of it is, is very important. In fact, it's more than that. It is urgent. Who bears the blame for the, un, for the wanton, unprovoked, or even provoked murders in our land? Who can we say bears the blame uh, uh, to it? That might be several areas that we can blame. <clears throat> But I feel if each one of us takes a, pers a personal responsibility, we can resolve the problem. Laying the blame on someone else does not cure the disease. But if you and I take an issue with it and begin to, Americans can do anything, it seems to me, that they set their hearts to do when their hearts are right with God. And I believe if we set our heart to do this. Now, now, now 20,000 murders a year in this country is altogether too much. While you're watching me during this brief moment, an American will be killed. That is too much. And you know that is too much. It might be you next. It might be your loved one next. We've got to do something about it. And that's what this series of lectures is all about. I've seen murder. I was in Hinterland, China. And as I was arriving in the city, coming in my rickshaw from the, uh, from the train station over to the compound where I was to stay, far inland China, uh, they were stoning a man on the sidewalk. So we commanded the rickshaw man to stop, and with our interpreter, we got out to investigate. We saw women throwing stones, you know, twice the size of a man's hand. Uh, we, we saw men throwing stones. We saw children laughing. I pushed the crowd back and got to the front, and there was a Chinese man battered to pieces. His guts were on the sidewalk. His brains were running all out over his body. If you've never seen it, uh, you don't know exactly what it's all about. It's a war zone. I, through my interpreter in other countries, you pay an interpreter and he lives with you. He's your shadow. I mean, he's the only communication you have with the people. So you keep him close to you. Through my interpreter, working fast, we asked six or eight or ten people, what, what's, what's going on? What's happening? Why is a man being killed? Finally, someone said, he was caught stealing. He was a thief. And so... We've killed him. We waited for a few moments and the crowd began to break up. There were policemen standing across the street, didn't move an eyebrow. Finally, the garbage man the next morning had to pick up the thief that was dead and haul him away to be burned on the, on the garbage dump. Now, I might have been the only one that was so severely hurt that day, except in the man that died. I couldn't get over that. I lived with that thing. I said, what if he wasn't a thief? What if somebody lied and screamed, thief, 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 when it was not true, and the man died? He died without a, a judge, an attorney, or a jury, or anything. He had, no, he had no help. He died on a sidewalk far inland Asia. Also, up near Tibet, we saw a man, ex I saw a man executed. The way they executed him, they have thorn trees with thorns about three or four inches long. They're heavy thorns. They're not like thorns you've seen. They're ten times as strong and big as a thorn that you're ready to see. You can't break it with your fingers. And they tied this man to a thorn tree. And then they kicked him into the tree, putting thorns four and five inches deep into his total body from his head to his feet. He screamed and he cried and blood began to come out all the parts of his body. 
and they kept kicking him deeper into the thorn tree. I couldn't find out with my interpreter what he had done wrong. I didn't, no one seemed to know what he had done wrong. He was executed before people, not by police, uh, but by civilians. And it burned a place on my conscience that I couldn't get away. And today, today, so many things happen. A member of my church, standing on his own sidewalk, told a young man with his motorcycle that was riding on fresh asphalt and destroying it, said, son, you shouldn't do that. That motorcycle rider came over, hit him on the head with his helmet, and he dropped dead right there in his tracks. That boy was out on parole, and the widow was so grieved, and she, she died soon after that. When she went to court, you would have thought that her husband had done the murdering. It was so sad. She was a broken and destroyed woman. That happened in my town. You've got your town. America has got a lot of towns. And we've got a problem, unprovoked murder. What can we do with it? What must we do with it? Is there a difference in the kind of person who commits this kind of murder? Is there a difference in a person who shoots you with a gun or who takes a blast of dynamite, attaches it to the bottom of your boat, blows up your boat and kills everybody on it? That's what happened to Lord Matt Batten, one of the most celebrated of Englishmen of our times. Lord Lewis Matt Batten died on his own boat by sabotage. The man wasn't even there to see them die. He put it on a boat in the harbor and blew it to pieces. Or the man that goes into the casino and starts a fire and dozens of innocent people die. Or the person sets fire to a hospital or to a school or to a home and they die. Unprovoked murder. Here's a few of those stories that I want us to get to. Because you see, I believe there's an answer. <laughs> I know there's an answer. But as long as you, as an American, act like there is no answer, then there isn't one. But when you discover that there is a problem and there is an answer, we can do something about it. Here are some cases that have caused a lot of press coverage of recent times. I was personally uh, subpoenaed to appear in the Cook County uh, Criminal Court to give what the judge called expert witness of what the state's prosecuting attorney uh, termed empirical powers influencing a human person. I am glad that the courts have uh, found a place for a man who knows the Bible and a man who knows living and a hundred nations of the world with all kind of cultures of the world comes. The case was that of an accused one, Mr. Roland Cashney. And Roland had a, a difficult time and, uh, in, in his life. Came from a very sad and sorrowful background. But the, 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 the Cook County Court got excited. They sent four of the state's attorneys, a men from the state attorney's office, uh, to, my, to my office, uh, which was 100 miles away. And these four men, lawyers and also court reporters, came. I have their names here. We will possibly not divulge them at this moment. And they came in for two hours. They listened to my side of the story. Uh, they were to prosecute this case that I was talking about. And so they came to hear my side of the story. Was it possible for an entity that's, that's beyond human power and strength? Was it possible for an entity to possess a human person uh, that that person became possessed of something outside and beyond himself that he became a destroyer with a power that was not human? And, uh, and those lawyers had never heard anything like they heard uh, that day, I, I can assure you. And twice we have been to this court in Chicago seeking to, uh, I said, I am not for the court and I am not f for the accused. I'm here for God's sake. I'm here for America's sake. We've got to find some answers to these things. 
A celebrated case also from the city of Chicago is that of John Wayne Gacy of Des Plaines, Illinois. Uh, he he, he uh, was pronounced guilty of the murder of 33 men and boys, mostly boys. Uh, the police discovered that John Gacy had dumped a boy's body into a river, and in doing so, his vehicle got stuck in the mud, and, and, and when the child was found and the vehicle was found, they put it together, and through one detective penetrating this thing, otherwise it had gone on for over a year, the, the boys disappearing, and, and this one man says, I'm going to penetrate the case, and, and he was able to find the person. In the, in the case of John Gacy, uh, he was a contractor, successful businessman, lived in a, in, a, in a beautiful home, but in the subfloor, beneath the subfloor, he buried these human beings. He even slept with the dead. Yeah, after he killed them, he even, he even slept with them. And you say, well, how did he conquer them? Well, he was also a clown, and in dressing like a clown, uh, he would... Uh, he would go to all the celebrations in his part and was quite a favorite. And he was also a part of the political machine and rose up in the ranks of the political party. They thought that he was that extra man that could always do what nobody else wanted to do and was in high favor uh, with them. So he was carrying on his business and, and he was a social success at the same time that he was destroying 33 human beings. And the way he would capture them, according to his case, is this. He'd invite them to his home to give them a job. When he's there, he'd show them some tricks. He said, I'm a, mag I'm, I'm, a I'm a magician. And he would put handcuffs on himself and maneuver them off. And he said, I'll teach you the trick. And he would put the handcuffs on them, and they were his prisoners. He'd choke them to death, and he also oftentimes, possibly every time, had it. Uh, uh, deviate sex with them. And this man uh, said that he had spirits within him and that he had one spirit in him that hated homosexualism. And he's, he says that he was told to do these things by a spirit. And it is uh, a, a terrible uh, situation that so many died in that city uh, from a person, from a person who uh, called himself at one time Pogo the Clown, and at other times a successful contractor uh, to build homes, and then taking uh, these boys uh, into his friendship, and they died at his hand in his home and were buried there underneath his house. Why would a man kill 33 people? When they talked with him, he didn't remember their names. He had no score against them whatsoever. He hardly knew and had no reason for doing it, excepting something inside of him, giving him strange compulsion to do that thing. Now, when we identify that, and when we understand that, we'll know that we're dealing with something beyond man. Now, psychology only comes from the Greek word that has to do with the mind. If you're going to deal with the mind, only the mind, you're never going to get a thing like this served. You've got to deal with something beyond and above the mind. And that mind, that has to do with demon power. And until we're willing to do that and capable of doing it, we will not be able to set men and women free from the, dev the devil's power. Maybe one of the most celebrated cases in recent history is that of, of, of Richard Speck, uh, the accused of killing eight nurses in the Chicago area. Judge, Judge Herbert uh, Passion, uh, who was a public, who was appointed the public defender, and uh, Gerald Getty as defense counsel for Richard Speck. He was only 24 years old, and he was what they call a drifter. He was involved in the murder of these eight nurses in the city of Chicago. Speck's arm, if you were to see him today, is a mass of tattoos. He said that most of which was put on when he was with a group of his Navy buddies when he was in the Navy, and they would all go to a tattoo together. One of the tattoos below his right elbow is a long dagger with a snake coiled around it. On his little finger, is a, on his right hand, is a solitary letter L for his name. And above his left elbow 
is a grinning skull tattooed on him. He can't get them off. Tattooed on his left arm, just below his elbow are the words, uh, born to raise hell. These are the things that he carried around on his body with him and couldn't get away of him. It was the night of July the 13th that this intruder entered into a nurse's residence in Chicago in an apartment building in southeast Chicago. And he gathered nine nurses together into a bedroom at gunpoint. And he took them slowly into other parts of the house, tied their hands and feet. And without a cry, without trying to escape, they died, all except one Filipina girl, Corazon Amra Rua, 23 years old. She slid under a bunk and she was overlooked by the killer. She stayed that away the next morning till she was sure he was gone. They found this young man in a, in, a, in a hotel, in a hotel room. When he heard the police were trying to find him, he tried to commit suicide. They took him to a hospital and there he was identified. And here we have a man that destroyed these eight nurses. The psychologist that stated that hatred for his stepfather and his former wife were two of the greatest hatreds of his life and possibly had to do with it. Speck did such things in prison as assaulting a fellow prisoner, throwing hot water on a sergeant and so forth. He confessed to the doctor that in a fit of anger, he kicked his mother in the head, seriously injuring her. I believe he was 18 years old at that time. The psychologist asked what was happening when he kicked his own mother and if he was sorry. He said, nope, I'm not sorry. He says uh, he showed no interest in the fact that he had kicked his mother in the head after knocking her down. Speck was asked, uh, could this mean I cannot control myself when I'm angry and I'm wild and not knowing what I'm doing? and that he could not answer. In his most serious moments, Spectrum, I don't know why I killed all those nurses. And so we find that while he was there, he did a lot of things that are spectacular. Really, you should read a book to find out. Dr. Zipperin, uh, who was a, psych a psychiatrist and was in care of this man for many months, one day was in the cell with him. And very quickly, he flashed a razor blade from between his fingers and he put it to the doctor's throat. And he said, now, nah, doctor, if I'm such a killer as they think I am, why don't I kill you? I have nothing to lose. And then he put the razor blade back in his pocket and smiled. And so we have a person here who had more than one, one spirit in him. And we have a person here that needs a lot of consideration. Let us go a little quickly through some of these, please. There, there was David Burkowski. He, he killed five women and one man. And, and uh, he is from the New York City area. He was called the son of Sam. The son of Sam. And uh, he did a lot of very, very strange and, and remarkable things. Uh, when they wanted to bring him into court, it was like bringing an animal in. He fought them. He bit them. He screamed at them. It took them an hour and a half to bring them, him into the courtroom. And so... Uh, uh, here is David Berkowitz. He was born Richard Falco, given up by his natural mother at birth, illegitimate child. He was reared by a person named Nathan Berkowitz, the owner of a small hardware store in the Bronx. His adopted mother died of cancer when he was a young teenager. His foster father retired to Florida before David Berkowitz became the son of Sam. And so you have a man uh, here that had 27 prison terms, totaling 500 and 47 years, if you can imagine such a thing. And, and here, uh, all through his life, he was a recluse, of course. And in his most terrifying moments, he called himself the Duke of Death. He called himself the Wicked King Wicker. He called himself the 22 Disciples of Hell. And uh, he called himself the Rapist and Suffocator of Young Girls. That was the way he referred to himself. After his incarceration, uh, David uh, said that he received his orders to kill from a black Labrador retriever that a dog told him. But he further, he explained that it really came from a 6,000-year-old demon who had been reincarnated into a next-door neighbor. Here was a man that was doing all this killing, and this man had a direct relationship with demon power. He, he, he told it, but I am not sure. I am not sure that the court understood it. I'm not sure that America 
understands it today. They read it. It's in the newspapers. The press have done exactly what they're supposed to do. They told it about it. But have you found that the man was energized and motivated by something beyond himself and that we're sure of this? He admits it and the court admits it. Let me name uh, a few more for you. Uh, there's a case of Theodore Streleski. Uh, Streleski is very interesting in that he, he is a, a professor of mathematics and he killed in the state of California, he is uh, accused that he killed his mathematics professor in order that he might go to the penitentiary and sit in silence and in quietness in order, in order to study mathematics. He killed his own professor so he could get in jail and study mathematics. Now, when you go into his life a little further, as we will in writing uh, a, a, little, a little later, you will find that this man had a spirit of hate in him that is beyond human realizing. He had a spirit of revenge in him that was beyond uh, the way a human uh, thinks or talks. He was not proceeding in life as he wanted to, and he was angry, and he took out his anger uh, against a fellow professor that he thought was above him and was beyond him, one who had taught him uh, his, his mathematics. It's one of the very strange cases. There is the case of Arnie Cheyenne Johnson. I, I wish we had, you know, lots of time to just discover one of these. This is a, a, a slender, muscular youth of 19 years of age. He went to a place where some Roman Catholics were, uh, were trying to exercise a spirit out of a child. And, and uh, he, he became so angry at the spirit while he was there, he commanded the spirit. Uh, he said, take on me, take me on. Leave the child alone, take me on. He had several strange manifestations after that. And then he killed a man that was a friend of his. And after it was all done, uh, he, didn't, uh, he didn't realize that, that he had done it. But he, as an unconverted person, challenged the devil to, to come out of the child because the Roman Catholic priests and some other people that were, <clears throat> that were trained in exorcism were not able to set the boy free. He said, take me on. He felt like he was stronger, though he knew nothing about a born-again experience. Uh, you read in the Bible of people that are trying to take on evil spirits when they don't have the power to do it. The evil spirit screamed back and says, Jesus we know and Paul we know, but we don't know you. And, and they jumped on to the persons and stripped them of their clothes and beat them up. And here was a man who, who, who lost his equilibrium, his, his, uh, his equilibrium, <clears throat> and he destroyed. In the state of Indiana, uh, there was a case of Stephen Judy. Uh, that, that Stephen is accused of, uh, of, of, of killing uh, a woman, uh, Terry Chastine, and, and drowning her three children, little Misty Ann five, Stephen Michael four, and Mark Lewis two. Uh, he destroyed these four lives. And uh, he told the press himself it was fair punishment for the crimes he'd committed and that he felt that the death sentence should be carried out and the death sentence was carried out. Uh, when he was 24 years old uh, with 2,822 volts of electricity as they pulsed through his body. Uh, here was a man who said, don't make a headstone for me, uh, just drive a wooden stake into the ground. Uh, he was a man, uh, uh, he told the, the jury, said, you better vote for the death penalty. It might be you or one of you or your family next. He recognized a power and a spirit beyond himself. And there's the Charles Manson case. Uh, everyone uh, should know something about the Charles Manson case. When you see a person like this become a person like this, and you read of the atrocities that were, that were performed by him and his slaves, they, they, they were mesmerized, they were hypnotized. They obeyed him like God, he was their God. And the things that he did with them, uh, immoralities and, and, and so forth, and besides the killings that they, that they did at him, you'll have to come to realize there must be a power uh, beyond, beyond, beyond human power and that we must say we, we must recognize it. There's the Jim Jones case of, of, uh, of South America in Guyana uh, where about 900 people committed suicide 
the voice of a person saying, do it and do it now. And they obeyed him. That's mass murder, uh, the greatest in history. And then you have the London stripper that I spoke to you about that when I came through England the last time, he had just taken his 13th victim, all of them young ladies that he had destroyed in this way. Now, these are human beings. They're born innocent little babies. They grow up in our society and they become so strange that you and I cannot know them.